I want to tell you the most interesting story in the world. Why a person becomes the person he becomes. Why a little boy or a little girl grows up to be the kind of person he or she becomes. Now, the estimates by the experts in this field are that most of us are using somewhere around 5% of our real potential. Some experts say as little as 1%. It means that we're only giving about 5% of ourselves to what we're doing to our days, our work, our families, everyone we know, our entire environment. But it also means that we're only experiencing 5% of the fun, 5% of the joy, 5% of the rewards we could be knowing, or less. All the experts are agreed that in each of us, there are deep reservoirs of ability, even genius, that we habitually fail to use. Why? We know that most people desire by nature to succeed. But what is success? What is this word that has become so famous in the world? What does it mean? Most people don't know what success is all about. And since they don't know what it's about, they really don't know where to look for it. Success is really nothing more than the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. This means that any person who knows what he's doing and where he's going is a success. Any person with a goal toward which he's working is a successful person. This means that the boy in, in high school who's working toward a diploma, or the boy in college toward a degree, is just as successful as any human being on earth because he knows what he's doing, why he's getting up in the morning, and where he's going. But conversely, if a person doesn't know what he's working toward, what it is he wants, doesn't have a goal toward which he's working, then he must, at least by this definition, be called unsuccessful. Why isn't then, with this simple definition, why isn't everyone successful? It should be easy. Yet surveys indicate that 19 out of 20, 95 percent at least, are not. In fact, a survey one time asked thousands of working men why they got up in the morning and went to work, and 19 out of 20 didn't know. 19 out of 20 working people didn't have the foggiest notion of why they got up in the morning and went to work. Under closer questioning, they said, well, everybody works. Well, that would be a good reason to quit. In fact, here's a little rule of thumb you might want to remember. Whatever the great majority is doing under any given circumstance, if you do exactly the opposite, you'll probably never make another mistake as long as you live. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. The problem with most people is that they're playing the world's most unrewarding game. And the name of the game is Follow the Follower. There's a story about a small town in which there was a jewelry store, and like all jewelry stores, uh, or most jewelry stores at least, he had a big clock in his window. And every morning for years, he'd noticed a working man stop, adjust his pocket watch to the same time as the clock in the window. He'd been doing this for many years, and one morning the jeweler was out in front sweeping a sidewalk, and so he asked the man, he said, tell me, why do you uh, adjust your watch to my big clock every morning? I've noticed you're doing that for years. The man said, well, I'm the foreman down at the big plant. He said, I want to make sure my watch is correct because I blow the quitting whistle every night at 5 o'clock. The jeweler looked at him rather strangely for a minute. He said, well, that's funny. He said, I've been setting that big clock in the window by that quitting whistle all these years. A very logical thing, but they could have been off six months. It was a case of a person just going along with what he thought to be correct without checking his references. So I want to suggest that from now on out, at least we do that, that we check our references and ask ourselves, are the people I'm following going where I want to go? Let me tell you the story of what we might call the average young man in our society. Now, from the time this boy is born, there's only one thing on earth he can do, and that's to begin to think, act, and talk like the people by whom he's surrounded. This is all in the world he can do. But right off the bat, the odds are 95 to 5 that he's thinking, acting, and talking like the wrong group. They're wonderful people. They love him. They'd do anything in the world for him. They want him to succeed. But the odds are 95 to 5 they haven't got the answers he needs if he's to reach fulfillment as a human being, if he's to reach this success that he wants if he's to reach into these deep reservoirs of ability and genius we know he possesses and draw it out, well, he starts in school. The most important thing to a little boy in school is to be liked by the other little boys in school. And so at this tender age, he begins to 
follow other little boys his same age, who don't know any more than he knows, and who do not necessarily have any capacity for leadership. And he does this in the first grade, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and year after year after year, he forms himself into a composite average of other little boys his age, trying to be like them, trying to do the only thing in the world that's impossible for a human being to do, which is to be like somebody else. Now, let's say he goes all the way through school, usually goes in the military service. Again, he's caught in a vice-like grip of conformity. Now, let's say he's 25 years old, out of school, out of service. What's he going to do? As a rule, uh, he'll go back to his hometown, unless he's married, in which case he'll go to his wife's hometown. But let's say he goes back to his own hometown. He's single. He doesn't know quite what to do. He's standing on a corner one morning, and a friend that he knew in school comes up and says, Hi there, uh, Charlie, what are you doing? He says, Nothing. He says, Why don't you come down and work where I work? It's a pretty good place. The pay's regular. We got all kinds of fringe benefits and so on, and so he does. The odds are about, again, 95 to 5, that his first job is taken as a result of random application. On the job, without thinking about it, the most natural thing in the world for him to do is to look around and see how the other guys are doing their job and to begin doing his the same way, assuming that what is normal for them is normal for him. No reason for this. He doesn't think about it. He just does it. Now, he has stretching in front of him 50 years or more in the golden age that man has been dreaming of since the days of ancient Greece. What's he going to do with these 50 golden years? Well, let's take a close look at him. We know that he works 40 hours a week as a rule. 40 hours a week, which leaves him 72 hours a week when he's neither working nor sleeping. 72 free discretionary hours each week to do with as he pleases. Now, at this point, of course, he's married. He has his little house and his little car. And this is about what he does with his free 72 hours every week. He'll do what the other fellows are doing with their free 72 hours every week, which is virtually nothing at all. On a typical day, he'll quit right on the dot, get in his little car, go to his little house, go in his little kitchen, kiss his little wife, and say, I'm tired. They've even figured out why he says that. The experts believe that he used to hear his father say that back when men used to get tired working during the day, and he picked it up and he repeats this every night when he gets home. He bolts his little meal and then heads for the living room where he turns on his escape box. Click. Takes 15 or 20 seconds for the screen to light up. A period of time he finds interminable, but he gets through it somehow, maybe... Kicks the dog, a thumb through a magazine or something. But then the screen lights up and he does too a little bit. And uh, there in front of him, uh, he sees people in all kinds of funny old-time costumes all killing each other at a great rate. Uh, one expert has agreed that uh, the average family can see more death and bloodshed and carnage on his television set in a week than Crassus saw when he crucified 6,000 prisoners on the southern road to Rome. But you know how those experts are. He could certainly be off one or two. But he sits there for about five and a half or six hours. Twenty-five percent of all free time now is spent in front of the tube, according to the latest statistics. Now, there's nothing wrong with this particularly, except that he's watching other people who are earning excellent incomes in the pursuit of their careers while he doesn't make a nickel and gets the only two things you can get from watching TV on that kind of a schedule. He gets red eyes and a hollow head. Now, this is not meant to be an indictment of television. I've got a couple of television sets at home, too. I have a couple of cars at home, too, but I don't go home at night and drive around the block for six hours. If there's some place I want to go, fine, my car will take me there. If there's a great program, like a golf match or something like that, I want to see it. But he sits there for six and a half hours until finally his wife, who's a little more practical than he is, taps him on the shoulder and she says, Charlie, I think it's about time you went to bed. You've got to get up in the morning and go to work. And he's okay, and he shuts it off. He knows how to do that. He just shuts it off and goes to bed. Next morning he gets up and he does this all over again. He does this every day for 40 years. At the end of 40 years, he's retired, which always kind of catches him by surprise. No one's ever figured that one out either. And then he dies at 85 or 90, the way medical science is moving us along out of sheer boredom. Well, what's the problem? Is there a tragedy here? Not really if that's the way Charlie wants to spend his life, our mythical, hypothetical young man. If he wants to spend his life that way, that's his business. He lives in a free society, he can do anything with it he wants. But there's a terrible tragedy here if he's living that way because of the total lack of a decision. If he's living that way simply because he's still doing what he was doing in the first and second grade, and that's going along with the fellows up and down the block on the unspoken assumption that they know how to live, then there's a real tragedy there. Because they've never known how to live. Not in all the recorded history of mankind. He never finds out who he is. He never reaches into the deep depths of his abilities, his talents. He never learns that he can have just about anything he wants in the world, that he can call his own shots, tell his own fortune. And it's kind of a pity. Well, what's needed? 
Well, what's needed, I think, is a checklist. Like an airplane pilot uses. I think that living successfully is as important as flying an airplane. And here are some of the things that I think should be on that checklist that could help this man live a more meaningful, more interesting, more exciting, more enjoyable life. The first thing that he ought to have on his checklist, in my opinion, is the word, a goal. A man without a goal is like a ship without a rudder. He doesn't know where he's going. He then belongs to that 95% that he's just living day by day, month after month, like a starfish or an amoeba. He needs to know where he's going. Back in the early days of navigation, sailors used to see a strange sight in the Antarctic. They'd see a giant iceberg towering high out of the sea, and it would be moving against the wind. The wind would be blowing this way. The great iceberg would be moving right into the teeth of the wind. And this, uh, of course, frightened the sailors whose ships were powered by the wind, until it was discovered that, of course, only a fraction of the great berg was visible, and that its huge, ponderous roots were caught in the great currents of the ocean. And it was being borne purposely along its way, regardless of the winds and the tides on the surface. Well, this is what a man needs. He needs his roots deep in a great mainstream of his own choosing. And then he'll move along his way, regardless of the winds on the surface of his life or short-term expediency. And he'll get to where he's going. The second word on our checklist might be the word attitude. It's been called the most important word in any language in the world. Because it's our attitude toward our world, toward all the people in it, that will determine the world's attitude and all the people's attitude toward us. It's a simple thing, most of us know it, but we tend to forget it. People will react to us according to our attitude. And our attitude is the greatest gift we can be given. You know, the little creatures of the world were given a wonderful gift by Mother Nature called protective coloring, in which they can blend into their background without uh, being seen. But man was not given this great gift because man was given an incalculably greater one. Only man has the godlike power to make his surroundings change to fit him. Because his environment will change as he changes. A man's environment is a merciless mirror of him as a human being. And if he thinks his environment could stand a little improvement, all he has to do is improve and his environment will improve to reflect the changing man. Third would be the word think. To think the highest function of which a human being is capable. It was put pretty well by the great Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Archibald MacLeish in his great play, The Secret of Freedom, in which he has one of his characters say, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. It's true. And so if we're gonna develop something, this is a good place to start. To think deliberately and with a purpose to spend a little time each day before a blank sheet of paper with our goal perhaps written at the top and come up with some fresh, new and exciting ideas. The next point on our checklist you might call the law of laws. That's what Emerson called it, this great old law of cause and effect. That our rewards in life will always be in exact proportion to our contribution, to our service. We all know this, really. We tell our children in Sunday school that as ye sow, so shall ye reap, but we forget that that's true. If a man is unhappy with his rewards, all in the world he's got to do is find ways of increasing his contribution, his service. It's like the story of the preacher who was driving down a country road, and all of a sudden he came to the most magnificent farm he'd ever seen in his life. It was beautiful. And so he saw the farmer approaching the road on his tractor, and so he hailed him, and he said, My good man, he said, uh, God has certainly blessed you with a magnificent farm. And the farmer thought for a moment, and he, he said, Yes, you're right, he certainly has. But you should have seen this place when he had it all to himself. And the preacher had his sermon for the next Sunday. He realized that all the farmers up and down that road had been given the same land, but one man had made something great out of it. Well, all of us are given the same land. We're given a human life. And each of us can make something great out of it, too, if we want to. The next point might be simply the word truth. Since everything we do has an equal and opposite reaction, unless what we're doing is based on truth, we're building on sand, and it can't stand. The next point would be R&D, research and development. None of us would want to work for a company or invest our money in a company that didn't have a very viable research and development department, that is, pumping a good percentage of its profits back into research and development because its future depends on it. But so does a man's. And you might ask yourself, how much of your own take-home pay have you spent during the past year for materials 
calculated to make you smarter this year than you were a year before. Calculated to make you a little better, a little bigger as a human being. To perhaps love a little more and hate a little less and do a little better job than you did a year ago. How much money are you pumping back into yourself and your future? It's worth thinking about. And finally, the strangest secret. At the beginning, I said, what makes a child grow up into the human being he becomes? Well, this is the reason for that. Of course, he's the confluence of a, of a genetic pool that goes back for thousands and thousands of years. His environment has an influence on him, of course. But what makes him become the person he becomes is that he becomes what he thinks about most of the time. It's as simple as that. We become what we think about most of the time. And that's the strangest secret. This is why thinking is so vital. This is why a goal is so important. Because we will become that. This is why people who set goals achieve them. The trouble with men is not in achieving their goals. They do that. It's in establishing them. Well, that's about it. I think it's good to remember that if we just go along with the crowd, we won't wind up with much more than the wish that we could do it all over again, and as far as we know, you can't. If we want to amount to anything as individuals, we need individual goals, individual thinking, individual actions, and we must never conform to the big group. We must love them, we must help them, we must serve them, because our whole success will depend on our ability to do these things. But never lose our own individuality and our identity by permitting ourselves to become submerged in what has historically proved itself to be little more than a suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. If we want to emulate someone, fine, but let's be choosy in whose steps we follow. It's the only life we've got. And remember to think. Imagination is everything, and we can become what we can imagine. If you find yourself getting depressed and down at the mouth, as we all get once in a while, you might want to remember this quotation by Dean Briggs. He said, do your work. Not just your work and no more, but a little more for the lavishing's sake. That little more which is worth all the rest. And if you suffer as you must, and if you doubt as you must, do your work. Put your heart into it and the sky will clear. And then out of your very doubt and suffering will be born the supreme joy of life. Believe it or not, in an age when we've come to nearly deify leisure time, we've almost lost sight of the fact that virtually all our satisfactions, rewards will come not from our leisure, but from our work. And don't forget the strangest secret. We become what we think about.